Hi, I'm Michael Kearns, and I am a longtime activist in the LGBTQ community. And I got into this uh, as a result of knowing Morris Kite, who more than 40 years ago actually called me one night at my home, and I was shocked to get a phone call from him, and he invited me to go to a meeting, one of these meetings that met weekly and uh, discussed what was going on in the community. If you can imagine, I think there were about 12, 15 of us that grew, and it was the most exciting phone call, one of the most exciting phone calls I'd ever received. So you can imagine my excitement to hear that my friend, Mary Ann Cherry, is writing a book that's coming out in 2020 about the life of Morris Kite, who was a very influential man, and you're gonna hear about how influential. Her book is coming out, as I said, and it's gonna be uh, published by Process Media, which is an imprint from Feral House, the title of the book, in and of itself, is a book. It's called Morris Kite, Humanist, Liberationist, Fantabulist, A Story of Gay Rights and Gay Wrongs by Mary Ann Cherry. This is her first book, and she has put an enormous amount of energy into this book. She's gone down many rabbit holes, but thankfully she has come up to the surface, and she's here with me today to discuss it. So, Mary Ann Cherry, who was also a friend of Morris Kite's, so she has an uh, inroad there <laughs> that not everyone does. Hello, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Michael. <laughs> it's good to be here with you. <laughs> well, good. So let's get this over with. That word, I mean, we get, we, I don't think we can go to our dictionary and find fantabulous, no. at least not yet. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if it's a word or not, but it came from our friend Mark Thompson. And he described Morris as a fantabulist, and it stuck with me. I just, I couldn't shake it loose. And you knew Morris, and you knew that he was fantabulous. <laughs> and he is, he was fantabulous, but more as a noun than an adjective. And yes. so I decided to run with it. I decided to just slap it on the cover and... I think it says everything that we need to know in a certain way, you know, I mean, um... Uh, we, we don't need to process too much of it. It's all, all the words are in there. Yes, yes. <laughs> right? exa well, he was the, definitely a humanist and a liberationist. And then on a more personal level, you would see him come out as this fantabulous. And his sort of, uh, you know, his self-promotionalist. <laughs> legendary. <laughs> right, legendary. Well, that's part of who he was, right? Mm -hmm. We'll get to more of that uh, later. So uh, why are you writing this story? Why are you? Well, that's, that's a uh, fair question. And... Um, I knew Morris for like the last 10 years of his life, and he was an interesting cat. And I sensed that there was a story there. I just, and my writer's instinct kicked in and it said, there's more under the hood here, this guy. So my first stop in my research was I, I went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he lived in the 1950s. Wow. And em almost immediately upon being there, I knew that I was, my instinct was correct. Is that a uh, small city, large town, holds a piece of Morris Kite. But that's in the book, we can go more into that. But the, and then when I came back to LA and the more people I talked to here in Los Angeles, they would just, there was a, an appreciation of Morris that went beyond his political activism. It was almost spiritual. And then some people just needed to vent. It was amazing, I, I couldn't believe. So it was two extremes. And then as I delved more deeply into the narrative around Morris, it was uncomfortably clear that this story is going to be well served by me having no personal stake in gay history. Um, I have no interest in purifying it or prettying up. I don't even have a, have a gripe. Uh, but, and I have also enormous respect for the value of gay studies in world and specifically American history. And I, really, I, I realized that my, my mission was to tell the truth and to be kind, and yet the truth is not always kind. Mm. And there were complexities around Morris, and there is a, an effort to kind of undermine his, uh, his efforts only in that the new rainbow capitalism that has emerged, they don't want gay liberation roots to be identified with, too, overly identified with uh, hippie roots. So that was Morris and his ilk. And then it became apparent that if I didn't tell this story as honestly and as objectively as possible, no one would. And then Kite's contributions 
would be marginalized in gay history, and gay history is already at risk of marginalization Absolutely. on its own. You know that. And so no matter how unlikely it is that an effective gay movement could have sprung out of a middle-class, law-abiding, conservative populace, <laughs> we have people who don't want to be over-identified with a liberal ideology, and yet that's where gay liberation comes from. And I'm not intimidated by that, probably to my peril. And also the reason I wrote this book is I grew up knowing gay people. I always know gay people. I knew gay people before they knew they were gay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so my, there is a, when I became aware of how screwed over gay people are in our society, I was immediately committed to, um, to opposing that oppression. And that's where I could look Morris Kite in the eye straight on and agree with him, no matter when, no matter where. We haven't said it, but let's just say that you happen to be a straight woman. I, yes, I happen to be a straight <laughs> I mean, woman. I think it's been implied, but let's say it. Yeah, let's get that out of the way, yeah, I, that I, nasty rumor. Hopelessly <laughs> hetero. I'm hopelessly, hopelessly hetero. I probably get a lot no, more action. No, I think it's important. I, which kind of leads me to maybe the next question. Uh, you, you talk about uh, Morris being, uh, I want to get these words, these two words, very important words together, an unreliable witness in his own story. Talk about that, because we know that Morris uh, played with his uh, own narration and his own facts, yes. his own fact checking. Yes, <laughs> and Morris, I didn't make Morris an unreliable witness, he did. He made himself an unreliable witness. And his self-importance is, as we already said, it's legendary. And so I had to deal with that. And I went around and around many different ways. Do I ease into his ego? Do I drop it in the middle of the book? And none of that worked. So I decided to just put it out right there on the front page, on the first, on the first page of the narrative, so that people who knew him will recognize him and know that I'm not trying to pull any wool. And the people who didn't know him would know what we're getting into here. So if he's speaking in the first person and saying, I built the Empire State Building, right. then you have to either assess that's true or it's not true, or some version What this there. unreliable witness did, he made a lot more work for me. I had to confirm and, and go back and forth um, on some of these facts, and most of it was confirmed, oddly enough. And there were a lot of false rumors around him that I had to that's go and, and, un, and unspool. So a lot of time was spent on gossip. Gossiping, gossiping, and, 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 then, and then when I got down to the facts, it really was quite interesting. But here's the thing about Morris's ego. Unlike uh, many of his contemporaries... We um, won't mention any names. Yeah, but, but there, there, were, there were a few that, like him who did not buy into the shame. He was not Morris, no matter if he was gay, straight, black, white, he would never be shamed. And it was his very worst qualities that really benefited so, so he, many people. He told as many negative stories about himself as he did positive. Correct. Which Correct. is great. Which is We've great. We've got to give him credit for that. And we got to understand, like when when he started this little mission, the oppression against gay people was so enormous so, that it was going to take a huge mm. ego to right those wrongs. Uh, you know, I and learned the, something right now about him that I didn't ever put together. And the fact is that it took many together. huge egos. There were a lot of egos involved in this, and it just, to write that shame, it, it, was un, it was unthinkable at the time. But he had the hubris to do it. Yes. So he had the hubris talking. to say, you pick yourself up and you go on out. So you have to balance one with the other. If you're going to be so honest about all the negativity and all the things you part took in that weren't so pretty, you have to then, on the other hand, build up the things that were pretty and, and right. uh, you know, successful and yes. doing yes. positive things and for the And people resented him for that. Some people resent, they I sort didn't. of wanted him to, no, you didn't, I no. know you didn't. Tell me your favorite story about Morris. Well, or God, I, have a, I have, the first one that comes to mind is probably the uh, Alpine County hijinks. And that was in 1973, when just on some fluke, he convinced the media that gay people were going to take over Alpine County. And Howard Fox described it as some godforsaken place in northeastern California that no sane gay person would ever want to be, much less in the winter. But Morris prevailed, and he told the media that there was going to be a takeover of the government in Alpine County. And it must have been a slow news day, but they picked it up, <laughs> and it went national, which in today's words, is, it went viral. 
Yes, and so exactly. finally, gay liberation was a national news topic. It, they, it got more news coverage than even Stonewall Rebellion. Wow. But, but my first, wow. my first, uh, my, my personal favorite is the Gay Pride Parade. And they had no idea what to expect. And they, it was the anniversary of the, of the Stonewall Rebellion. And there had to be something. Well, they had to go, Morris and his ilk, had to go to the California Supreme Court. And the, the court did not rule until late Friday night, Friday evening, and the, the parade was scheduled for that Sunday. And they allowed the permit to go through. The, the judge said to the LAPD, you cannot stop these people from using a public sidewalk from the public passage. They have every right in the world. So parade was on. Well, no one knew what was gonna pop out of the cork on this one. It was amazing, and I hope that when the history of heroes, of courageous people is written, that everyone who is marching in that parade is included, because wow. it took an enormous amount of courage. How to many go. people were in that parade? Um, you know? Well, the estimates are anywhere about 1,800 individuals, and they had all sorts of wild, oh, you can only my, imagine, my. and it was really- Who was waiting for how many years to happen? Exactly. An explosion. It was the official coming out. It really was. The it was coming out and parade. There was something changed after that day. It really did. It 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 pulled something apart and it pulled something else together. together. Right. Yeah. And the LAPD was expecting a riot and the worst they got was a traffic jam. And they kept it nonviolent. If he that did was, nothing else other than that, which brings me to what do you think his biggest moment uh, his, his legacy? legacy? The parade is still going 50 years later. So that's Hello. nice. It's in, it's in every major city across the world and in many towns. So that wow. in and of itself, that it's still going, 50 years in 2020. But Kite should really be, I hope he's remembered as a grassroots activist. And what he did, you know, when, it, when Kite saw something, he didn't just say something, he did something. He organized. I mean, I was familiar with the six o'clock a.m. phone calls. I'm sure you got them. And this is our mission for the day. And the hangups. And the hangups. He never said goodbye. <laughs> the conversation was over, and, it, and hello, he said, hello. He was going down his yellow pad, and that was next call. And he would he organized people. He knew how to get people. He could get, you know, 500 people onto a site. And this was before email and texting. Can you imagine? He had phone trees. He had this organized. He was a phone tree. He was the phone tree. <laughs> and he learned a lot of this. He took a lot of this out of the head of his anti-war activists. It was amazing. It really Truly was. Amazing. It really was. And I, and I applaud the activists that we have today, the grassroots activists who really, you know, and they use the tools that we have available to us. But we forget that it takes enormous courage. It still takes some kind of... Um, you have to have some kind of pushiness in you to say, we're going to do something about this. Right, right. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult than talking at the bar and drinking drinks after drink and, and, and saying what you're going to do. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to, yes. Appearing courageous and being courageous are two different things. Right. <laughs> yes. So... I think I, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of the landscape here. I think so. I think your incredible I think the, book coming out in 2020. 2020 would I'm be so out excited. in April 2020. And um, I think I want to tell you one more and one, one more story about Morris because I, I, as I said, I knew Morris for the last 10 years. And I kind of knew he was an interesting guy and stuff. And then I remembered, oh my gosh, Morris is the guy who I heard about in the 60s and the 70s when he would have yard sales at his little cottage downtown Los Angeles. This is long before yard sales were up there. Before I knew him, certainly. And he had also in those, during those yard sales, while everybody was out in the front of the house, people were getting treated for STDs in the back room. They called it the clap shack. And he got real live doctors to risk everything to treat people off the books. Because in those days, if you had an STD, it had, to be, it had to go into the Board of Health, and the Board of Health would then notify your next well, you of kin, marked. your yeah. employer, oh and it very often appeared in the newspaper. So there were a lot of people running around with STDs who would never get treated if it wasn't for the clap shack. Well, now that's a story. Yes, and there's a yard sale going on in the front. And so that when I realized, when I put all those pieces together and I asked him, I said, did you have yard sales 
And he, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, yes, yes. And, he, and, <laughs> oh, and, and that yes, was yeah. the beginning of the Gay and Lesbian Center. That was the true humble beginnings. And well, he, you can see that, that I can, mean, that's the social aspect, exactly, the health exactly. aspect. And he had an underground bail fund too that he oh, started in the late that's 50s. So heartening. So if you're a, oh my gosh. Yes, oh my God. It is, it is. So I'm, I'm looking forward to you reading the book. Well, I, I, I can't I'm looking wait. Forward to, yeah, and you always, you always have some interesting reading material. Oh by my your God, I'm, I'm curious. Well, what are you reading these days? Well, I, the, the book that I'm promoting and talking about is uh, Ocean Young's book, uh, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, which is, a, it's, it's said to be a novel. He kind of winks at the notion of a novel because it's clearly autobiographical. And it's a Vietnamese writer. He had written a, a book of poetry, but he's uh, up for the National Book Award and he's won the Genius Award, the MacArthur, one of the Genius Awards. He's brilliant. He's a young writer and the book is so sexy and romantic and political undertones. But it's a, a book written by this young man to his mother about his, his desire to be an openly human being, oh. really. But of course, what goes What's into that is gay again? and fluid gender. On Earth, we are briefly gorgeous. Nice. Yes. Nice. So on Earth, Mary Ann Cherry is definitely gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, on wherever he is, Morris Kite is definitely gorgeous. And so are all of you watching. So please, Put Mary Ann Cherry's book. I'm going to say the title one more time, and I am going to get it right because I'm going to read it here. Uh, Morris Kite, humanist, liberationist, fantabulist, a story of gay rights and gay wrongs. Read it. Thank you for joining us.